Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Good afternoon. Muna. Good afternoon. <laughs> Let's go ahead and then get started. This is another Ken seminar today. I'm very pleased to welcome, introduce Dr. Sharma to give uh, the Ken seminar uh, series this week. Uh, he is going to. I'll talk about what the, what research is going to talk. Uh, to give his presentation. He's going to be talking about one of the recently completed ICT projects. But just a little bit about a little bit background and intro for uh, Dr. Sharma. Uh, he is a research senior research scientist in the Illinois Sustainability Technology Center. How many of you know this ISTS? On campus. Just one, two. Yes. So, where is this uh, place, Punit? Just tell me. <laughs> uh, in research park. In research park, okay. It's right uh, near to Eiffel Technology. Okay. So, uh, it's, it's a shame that nobody knows uh, where you're coming from. Uh, that's why I told BK today, Dr. Sharma, to give a short presentation about uh, this research facility, which also we uh, were introduced very recently. Uh, I consider actually a shame on myself not knowing this place uh, during my PhD and then afterwards. But uh, it's a great facility, lots of opportunities to collaborate, uh, uh, to conduct uh, you know, testing and research. Uh, and uh, Dr. Sharma is also on the faculty list of agricultural and biological engineering and also a junk professor at uh, uh, energy and Environmental Systems at North Carolina A&T State University. I didn't know that before. Uh, his talk, his title of his presentation is about uh, the modeling the performance properties of grass and rap blended asphalt mixes through chemical compositional information. This is a study that we worked together. So he's going to present the, the findings that was also published in the recent uh, ICT report. Let's just give him a round warm applause. And make Thank you, Hassan, for the introduction. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, before I start my presentation, I would like to thank all the students and postdoc who worked on this project. Jingma, she was a master student here, and she did a lot of work, uh, rheological characterization of on, on this project. Uh, Dr. Bidya Kumar, she was a postdoc, and she did most of the chemical characterization work. And Puneet helped us on the correlation part, uh, correlating the chemical composition and the rheological work. And Professor Ozer uh, and Professor Al Qadi, uh, they have been in this project and a uh, crucial part of this project. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Raj Gopalan uh, from Illinois Sustainable Technology Center. So, this is the, an outline of my talk. Uh, I'll be talking uh, since most of you don't know what is uh, IS, where is ISTC and what is ISTC. So, I'll give you a brief introduction on the ISTC. And then I'll start with the objectives that we had for this project, uh, materials that we used in this project, and then chemical characterization part that we uh, did on this project, and then rheological characterization, and then finally, uh, how we tried to correlate the composition uh, and the performance part. So uh, we actually report to Office of Vice Chancellor uh, for research. And PRI, I think it's. Uh, it's the biggest uh, institute on campus, employing around 1,000 people. And it consists of uh, five sister surveys. So Illinois Archaeology Survey, Illinois Natural History Survey, State Geological Survey, Water Survey, and uh, Illinois Sustainable Technology Center. So most of these other surveys, Natural History Survey, Archaeology Survey, State Water Survey, and Geological Survey, uh, they are mainly dealing with the Illinois natural and cultural resources. Why Illinois Sustainable Technology Center, we basically cater to the needs of industry in Illinois. So we work a lot with the industry and uh, uh, come up with the ways to help the industries of Illinois. So this is uh, basically uh, how when ISTC was established around 30 years ago, uh, the initial state mandate for ISTC was to reduce the waste uh, that industries are generating, and then if they are generating any waste, how to manage that waste. And uh, typically, uh, uh, we consider ourselves as the advocate for energy, water, and environment. 
and we advance the sustainability uh, in the industries through emerging technologies and we do a lot of research and then we provide technical assistance to the industries uh, and public engagement. So these are the, this is the triple bottom line with which our uh, center works, uh, planet, people and profit. And to give you an example, uh, like uh, an, a project that we have been working on is uh, CO2 capture and utilization. So that's important for the sake of planet and then if we can remove the CO2 that's going in the atmosphere and then we can capitalize on the CO2 uh, and make some useful product out of that, that will be good for people. And then uh, our third main uh, idea is that uh, whatever technology we are working with, it should be economically feasible. So it should, it should generate some profit also. Uh, in ISTC, uh, we have three major groups. One is applied research group, and then we have second group. Uh, the applied research group, it works on different kind of projects. So we take projects uh, which have already done some basic studies, and then we can work on those projects. Then emerging technologies and assistance program. This is a group which has three offices. They have an office in Chicago. They have an office in Southern Illinois, Peoria, and then Champaign. And they heavily work with industries, and their main emphasis is how they can make industries more sustainable in terms of energy they are using, in terms of uh, water uh, sustainability, and then also if they are generating any waste, how you can take care of that uh, waste. And then our third group is sponsored research, public engagement, and communication. So they are basically doing all the outreach work that we are doing at our center. And in ISTC, we have a team of chemists and engineer. Then in this chemists and engineer, we have people with expertise in petroleum chemistry, chemical engineering, environmental chemistry. And then we have a really good analytical facilities uh, uh, compared to the uh, facilities that you can find on campus. We have GCMS, and we have different kind of GCs. Then we have LCs. And then we have FTIR and uh, all the analytical facilities we also have the metals for metals analysis we have icp at our center and we do a lot of collaboration so we started working with ict uh, we have already some ongoing collaboration and mou uh, with ioc india and also uh, kuwait institute of scientific uh, research with whom we are working so this just gives you the flavor of projects that we are working on. So we work on materials use and reuse, and so there are various projects in that. Then we work a lot with uh, pollution prevention, uh, like sustainable electronics, and then pharmaceutical and personal care products, nutrients, metals, and then a lot of water use and reuse work uh, we are doing, like desalination and then water conservation. And then like I mentioned, that we do a lot of technical assistance. Uh, providing this technical assistance to the Illinois industries. And the main idea is waste reduction, energy reduction, and water conservation. And the public engagement part is done by the SERPEC. Uh, so we participate in all these activities that's happening on campus. And then finally, we do a lot of technology demonstrations. So if there are some technologies, or if there are uh, some technologies that need to be demonstrated in our pilot lab, we have a pilot lab so we can demonstrate those technologies so that other industries, they can come and then they can also implement these technologies in their uh, industry. Uh, in ISTC, uh, we are part of applied research group and we basically leverage whatever basic research is done and we work with a lot of industrial partners and our final product is industrial demonstration or deployment. So some of the projects that we are working with, which might be of interest to you, uh, is uh, we just finished a project on conversion of waste plastic to crude oils uh, to produce gasoline and diesel. Uh, so a lot of this plastic ends up into the landfill. And if you can take this waste plastic and convert it into gasoline and diesel, uh, we get a lot of value out of that plastic. Then waste tires, uh, we produce fuels. But other than fuel, we also produce a residue that comes off, out of it, which contains a lot of carbon plaque. And we have shown in our study that it can be used as a uh, asphalt binder replacement uh, product also. Then another project that we just uh, we are working on is uh, converting different kind of biomass, like miscanthus, corn stover, wood chips, and converting those biomass into bio oils. 
and then using those bio oils uh, either as a blend component or rejuvenator for asphalt binders. And we do a lot of work on vegetable oil modification, which can be used as bio-based lubricants and additives. Uh, we have done work on predicting the oxidation stability of petroleum and uh, petroleum and bio-based lubricants using DSC and TGA. And this can again be uh, used to study the oxidation stability of asphalt binders. Similarly, we have done study where we have um, found the correlation between the low temperature flow properties of petroleum lubricants with NMR derived structural parameters. And if we uh, come up with the structural parameters uh, for the asphalt binder, uh, we might be able to predict the low temperature properties with this also. So coming uh, back to the project that uh, we started, and this, this was a uh, project that was uh, outgrowth of this uh, R27128, uh, which was testing protocols to ensure performance of high asphalt binder replacement mixes using wrap and dress. So when we started this project, uh, we had uh, the main objective was to evaluate the chemical properties of the virgin binders that we were planning to use in it then look at the recycled uh, binders that uh, exist in wrap and dress, and then their blends, and then also looking at the chemical properties of the aged versions, uh, RTFO, PAV, and double PAV version. And then find out how presence of these binders from wrap and dress affect the composition and performance. And the last part was to correlate this uh, chemical composition with the performance properties and then also study the uh, effect of aging on chemical and rheological properties. So this is uh, uh, just in nutshell uh, the asphalt binder composition. Asphalt uh, binder typically contains around uh, 5 to 20 percent saturates, uh, which only contain hydrogen and carbon, uh, and these can be uh, like alkanes or these can be aromatics, uh, uh, neptine, uh, neptine kind of compounds also. And then 30 to 60 percent of aromatics. So these are uh, these can be fused uh, polynuclear aromatics, or these can be a single aromatic ring with long branches. And then resins are typically uh, these polyaromatic compounds, but also contain some heteroatoms like oxygen or nitrogen. And then we have asphaltins, which is uh, big molecules and contains nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur kind of compounds which typically forms like 5 to 30 percent uh, uh, of the binder. And a typical elemental composition of binder is uh, it contains around 80 percent carbon and then around 10 percent hydrogen and then remaining can be sulfur, nitrogen and oxygen depending on the crude oil supply for that binder. So uh, the way we started working on this is uh, we wanted to first find out what the elemental composition of these binders, then uh, chemical analysis uh, using different techniques of this virgin and aged binders, and then extracted binders from these uh, different mixes, and then find out the rheological characterization of these binders, and finally, the correlation. So these are the materials that we used in this study, and as you can see that we have uh, these three original binders, uh, 5828, 6422, and 7022. Uh, then we had another set of binders, which was extracted from wrap and dress. Uh, and then the third set of binders came from uh, extracting uh, from these RC mixes, uh, which contains uh, asphalt binder material ranging from 0 to 60 percent. Uh, so with these materials, then we also, uh, Jing, she did the RTFO on these three virgin binders and PAV and double PAV. So that gave us one set of the binders. And then the second set was the binder that was extracted from RAS and RAP. And then the PAV was done on these binders that was extracted from these N90 series. So we had this and then PAV versions of these. And then we also looked at some of the other toll mix and field core samples while doing the characterization. So in N90 series, you may already know that uh, in N90 series, we had a salt binder uh, component ranging from 0 to 60 percent, and it contained 
the base binder was 6422 in 90 and then in 90 90 10 and then 5828 in 1920 in 30 and then we had ras1 uh, here and then ras1 here 5 percent and then 7 percent ras1 in 1930 and then ras2 rap 1 and rap2 in this one so once we had all these binders uh, then we started looking at the techniques that we can use. So we used uh, FTIR, elemental analysis, TLC, FID, AFM, and GPC. So with FTIR, we can get the aging information due to oxidation. And we can calculate these parameters, carbonyl compounds, sulfoxides. And from elemental analysis, again, we can get oxygen content. From TLC, FID, we can get the SARO, SARA kind of components, saturates, aromatics, resins, and asphaltins. And from AFM, we can get the we can look at the microstructures of the materials, and then we can get the visual pictures. And from GPC, uh, we can get uh, large molecular weight, medium molecular weight, and small molecular weight components. So, how these uh, the components that are present in binder, how these components contribute uh, to the binder properties? So, saturates uh, these are thought to be crack initiators. So uh, if uh, if there are high saturate content in non-aged asphalt, then it, cause, it can cause a similar influence as uh, oxidative aging. And you will see increased B structure if you have higher saturates. While if you have resins, then large polyaromatics and polar compounds, these can form hydrogen bond, and then it will increase the viscosity and stiffness. Asphaltins uh, are also thought to be increasing the B structure, but what they can do is they can harden, they can cause the hardening and brittleness. And carbonyl and sulfoxide, these will increase if uh, there is, a, if we are adding more ABR or if we are aging uh, the binder in this one. So let's look at these techniques. Uh, so the first technique uh, that we use is TLC FID, and it's very similar to uh, if you take a binder and, and if you uh, put it on column, then you can separate it into four components, saturates, aromatics, resins, and asphaltins. So we can do the same thing with TLC FID, and we get like really nice four peaks, saturates, aromatics, resins, and asphaltins. And we can, with this composition, we can differentiate between aged and virgin samples. And typically, the saturates, these are inert to oxidation. Uh, oxidation. And whenever aging starts, the aromatics will start converting to resins, and resins will start converting to asphaltins. So you will see a decrease in aromatics, and then you will see an increase in asphaltins and resins. And um, in the method development, first you have to prepare the sample. You have to dissolve sample in some solvent, and then you can put it on a silica chrome rod. And then you develop those chrome rods with the uh, haptane which is a non-polar solvent, then you go slightly polar. When you will use haptane, then it will move this saturate component here. When you will use tolvin, then it will move the aromatics to this place. And then when you will use THF, then it will use, it will move the resins from that place. And whatever is remaining behind, it will come here as asphaltin. So that's how it separates. So once you develop those chrome rods, then you can scan and then you can get a really nice chromatogram, and from this chromatogram, we can get the area percent of these components. So when we did the analysis on uh, these samples, so this is the uh, binder uh, set that we used. So here you can see that we have 5828 with all four. We have RTFO, PAV, and then double PAV for this, similarly for 6422. And if you see in the 6422, uh, you can see uh, that as we keep on aging these samples or as we go to more and more uh, harsh conditions in aging, uh, the resins, like I mentioned, that resins will keep on increasing uh, and resins plus asphaltins, it will keep on increasing. And similarly, in this in nine, uh, N90 series also, uh, you can see that aromatics will decrease uh, once uh, once you start adding more and more ABR in it, and then the asphaltins, the resins will uh, resins will increase as you keep on adding more and more ABR component, and then ar aromatics will decrease. So 
this shows like similar kind of behavior like we have seen in the aging. So, aromatics decreases uh, with aging and the resins increases with aging. And in toll mixes, we found that uh, uh, in some of these uh, toll mix and field core samples, we found the highest resin and uh, residue content and have really low aromatic content here. Uh, what we also found that uh, the resin and aromatic content in this N9020 and N9030, it was kind of very similar to what you see in PG5828 PAV aged sample. So, basically if you are using these kind of binders or in these mixes, you are starting at a stage where the binder is already aged uh, similar to a PAV aged sample. And here you can see when we took these uh, binders from here and aged uh, PAV ASD samples. So, you can see in each of these cases, uh, once you age it, the aromatics will decrease here and then again here. And in all these cases, the resin component will keep on increasing uh, after the aging. So, aromatics decreases and resin in, uh, increases with PAV aging. The second technique that we used is the gel permeation chromatography. So, in gel permeation chromatography, it is basically a liquid chromatograph technique. So, what happens uh, when you put the material in it, uh, the, the column, it has different kind of pores. So, the larger molecular sizes will come out first and then after that, the medium molecular weight sizes will come and then the smaller molecular weight materials will come out in the end from this and the peak will look like this one. So, this is the large molecular weight uh, size which will come out first from the column uh, and this is the retention time. So, when peak starts, the large molecular weight size will come first and then medium molecular weight size and then small molecular weight size. So, the way uh, we, sep we get these uh, composition in terms of this LMS, MMS and SMS is we take the uh, first 5, uh, we split this whole peak into 13 slices and first 5 slices, uh, we use it as a component for larger molecular weight size, then 6 to 9, we use it for medium molecular weight size and then last 10 to 13, we use it for the small molecular weight size components. And if you see here, uh, we have this uh, different aged samples. So, with aging, you can see that the larger molecular weight size component will increase and uh, that is expected like when aromatics get converted to resins and resins get converted to asphaltins, the molecular size will increase and the molecular weight of those components will increase and that is why you are seeing the increase into the uh, larger molecular weight size. And since you are seeing the increase in large molecular weight size components, you will see a decrease in the smaller molecular weight size and the medium molecular weight size does not vary that much, but in all these cases you can see that the small molecular weight size will keep on decreasing as you keep on aging these samples more and more. And same thing you can see here in the wrap and wrap samples, you will see here that the small molecular weight size components is really less. Uh, as you can expect in this one, like in, in all the PAV versions, you can see it varies from 0.02 to 0.07 and that is what we are seeing in the wrap and wrap samples also here. Then in, in this one, uh, in the N90 series again, uh, you can see here, uh, once you have this and once you age these samples using PAV, you can see a decrease in the small molecular weight size. and a corresponding increase in the large molecular weight size. Similarly, in the N9020 and so in virgin binders typically, this is the range that we find for the large molecular weight size. We have more of large molecular weight size and then once you age it, then it goes down to around 0.4. Uh, in reclaimed also, it is somewhere in that range and this is the N90 series where we have it is around between 0.36 to 0.4 and in PAV version again it is less. And the same corresponding uh, numbers you can see here, you start with higher number for small molecular weight size, but as you keep on aging, 
it keeps getting smaller and it keeps going down to lower numbers. The third technique that we used is uh, uh, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy and we can take small amount of sample and we can find out like what, chemi what chemical functional groups are present in the samples and we can look uh, the functional groups that are of interest to us is our carbonyl compounds, sulfoxides and then amount of polymer. These carbonyl compounds and sulfoxides, these are formed as a result of aging. So, more you age the sample, you will see more of these peaks. And if the sample also contains polymer, then you can also find out how much polymer is present in the sample. And typically, these are the parameters that we use. So, we use these peaks, the peaks at 1460 and 1375, these peaks does not change. So, these are used as uh, the reference ones. And then 1700 uh, peak is typically for the carbonyl compounds, the 1030 peak is typically for sulfoxide and then 966 and 699 peak is basically for the polymer, uh, styrene butadiene, styrene polymer. And this is how FTR spectra looks like. So, you can see here that this uh, 1475 and then uh, 1450 and 1375 peaks these are almost same, these are not changing with the binders. Uh, the only thing that is changing is the carbonyl peak. So, if you have a RAS sample, you will, you can see or if it is an A sample, you can see a, a bigger carbonyl peak. Similarly, you can see a bigger sulfoxide peak at 1030 and then if it also contains a polymer, then you will also see 966 and 699 uh, the styrene butadiene uh, styrene polymer peak in it. And here uh, you can see uh, how the binder changes uh, with aging. So, this is the original binder, this is for after uh, RFOT and then this one is after the PAV and you can see that carbonyl peak increases uh, in PAV a lot compared to uh, just in RFOT. Similarly, the sulfoxide peak, you can also see a bigger peak for the sulfoxide. Uh, with this technique, we can also uh, look for the vegetable oils, if uh, vegetable oils are used in the binders. Uh, although we have not been able to see any uh, peaks for the reobs, but we can definitely see the peaks for the vegetable oils, if the vegetable oils are present in the uh, binder. As you can see, uh, the 5828 with vegetable oil, it is a really sharp peak for carbonyl and this carbonyl peak comes because vegetable oil structure contains a uh, ester uh, functionality and that carbonyl uh, peak comes from this ester functionality. So, once we do the analysis, then we can find out these two parameters, uh, carbonyl index and sulfoxide index and um, we can see that in virgin binders, uh, there is lower amount of carbonyl and sulfoxides, but as you keep on aging these samples, these keep on increasing, uh, both of these indexes carbonyl and sulfo uh, sulfoxide index uh, in, all, in all the binders that we studied. And typically uh, in aged binders, there is uh, carbonyl index it is typically higher than 0 0.09 and sulfoxide index is higher than 0 0.13. And you can see that uh, the RAP and RAS has uh, higher, num higher values for these uh, indexes. Typically for RAS and RAP, these uh, range, these are like higher than 0 0.10 and then sulfoxide is uh, also higher. For uh, virgin binders, most in most cases we found that the value of this is less than 0 0.05. Then for N90 series, uh, we see the same uh, trend uh, once you take the sample and then once you do the PAV on it, you will see the increase uh, in these indexes. So, as uh, you age these samples, these indexes will increase. And these are good indicators uh, like how much uh, the samples have aged over a period of time. Then in this, uh, uh, you can 
we we can also see the oxidation using the oxygen uh, percent uh, determined using the elemental composition. Uh, in virgin binders, we will have lower amount of oxygen uh, and then in RAS and RAP, we have the highest amount you can see. Uh, here we are reporting as sulfur plus oxygen together, so it is highest in these cases. Similarly, in N90 uh, and toll mix, those are kind of in between uh, RAP and RAS and the virgin binders. And again, if you see these samples, you can see that uh, the oxygen content keep on increasing, uh, which is a function of oxidation on uh, that. Uh, as we go to more and more uh, harsh oxidation, uh, you will increase the oxygen content in the binder. And then here uh, we have these two as separate, so sulfur as separate and then oxy oxygen as uh, separate. And you can clearly see here uh, as a function of aging, the oxygen content increases in all the cases uh, shown here. Then another technique that we used for qualitative purpose is uh, atomic force microscopy. And it is typically used to study the surface topography. Uh, we can also study the force separation in it. And people they have also used uh, it to generate the force curve that can be used an indication for stiffness and addition. Um, in AFM, we see the presence of these B uh, structures which uh, are called wax B structures. And in uh, these ones, you can see that uh, if you have less wax, then the B structures uh, may be smaller. So, uh, you can see here that uh, this, this is a, uh, when you zoom it, you can clearly see uh, how this B's look like in this one. And in AFM, there are th uh, four phases. So, this B structure phase, uh, which is uh, called catena phase, and then surrounding uh, to this is uh, periphase. And then this, met this in between area is called paraphase. And then there are also some uh, fourth phase, uh, which may not have like B's, um, that, that is also present. Um, and there is a big controversy on uh, what these B structures are. So, uh, some of most of the people they have ascribed these B structure due to the presence of saturates. And there are some who also said that this may be due to the asphaltins, and then another one uh, they said that this may be due to the aromatics. But it appears that most of the people they agree that these B structures are coming because of the saturates uh, or the wax kind of materials present in the present in the binder. So here you can see uh, how these uh, microstructures vary. Uh, when you go from lower PG grade to higher PG grade. So, this uh, looks like really uniform material, uh, no phase separation in this. And you can see that uh, the periphase, you cannot clearly see the periphase here. But as you go to the higher PG grades, you start seeing this well developed periphase, uh, and then you can also start seeing the paraphase. So, as you keep going to higher PG grades, you uh, start getting like uh, phase separation in these uh, materials. Similarly, if you see, uh, if you take a 5828 and then uh, this is the RTFO aced and then PAV aced sample, and you can clearly see uh, how this transition is happening uh, because you have more and more polar structure in it. So, it start forming this periphase, and then it is the uh, uh, and you can clearly see the paraphase also are present in these ones. In N90 series, uh, since this is most, this is only the binder here, so the topography of N90-0 and N90-10, it is kind of very similar to the virgin binders. But uh, when you go to these materials which contain higher amount of ABR, you can clearly see that these uh, B like uh, catena phase these become very small and it sometimes uh, you don't see that very well so this color contrast then about the profile 
yeah and then uh, the periphase um, you you can see uh, that the these periphases are present but you don't see really nice uh, uh, this b structure catenaphase in it and then you also see uh, very pronounced periphases as you keep on adding more and more abr to these samples the other thing that we found that uh, uh, when you when you are studying this n90 10 or n90 20 which contains lower amount of abr then you can you can get repeatable uh, topographic images for those samples so which shows that these are homogeneous samples and that's why we are able to reproduce those pictures but as you keep on going to uh, higher one n 1930 or n 1960 it becomes very hard to generate the repeatable images uh, for example here you can see that uh, both images were taken from n 1960 but the images uh, uh, are not repeatable so it means that the material is uh, not homogeneous and it's uh, becoming more and more heterogeneous uh, material so this way you can also study uh, how good is the mixing or how homogeneous is the material and if when when does the material starts becoming more and more heterogeneous then we also looked at the force blending so we took a 58 28 sample uh, which typically looks like uh, and then we had this uh, wrap sample uh, so you have the re really nice b structures here <coughs> and you can clearly see that in the wrap there is a big catena phase or b like structures and it also has if you compare these two pictures you can clearly see these that it contains a lot of periphase material and very small portion of paraphase which is the space in between these but when you mix these two together then it's entirely different and uh, you have really uh, you have more of uh, this paraphase here and then uh, doesn't look like uh, either uh, similar to the wrap 2 or to the 5828 Similarly, uh, this was uh, mixed with the RAS uh, 2 and RAS 2 it is kind of different topography. We have not seen this in any of the other samples um, and not, uh, even the RAP one also we were able to see the B structure, but here we, we did not see the B structure in this one and when you mix these two together, um, then you start seeing uh, some of the B structures and then you also start seeing the periphase and paraphase in this one. So, the material that you are getting after mixing it is kind of in between uh, these two uh, 5828 and the rest kind of material. And here uh, if you have a virgin binder and if you are if you age this sample to RTFO and PAV uh, then these uh, topographic images kind of look very similar to uh, what you get in N9020 and N9030. Uh, so, which again shows that your material with higher amount of ABR, it is kind of looking like the PV kind of uh, the PV aged uh, binders. Then the second part of work was done by uh, most of this work was done by Jing and she did all the rheological characterization. So, she used uh, uh, the original binders um, that was used in the mix and then extracted binder and uh, the DSR was used to verify the PG grading and also find out these parameters complex modulus, lower row, R value and crossover frequency and then BBR was used uh, to generate the delta TC parameter. So, these are the test conditions for DSR and VBR and I will not go into much detail in this and these are the calculated parameters. So, rating parameter was calculated which shows uh, if higher value then higher rating resistance uh, and it increases with aging. Uh, similarly, the Glover row also increases with aging and it indicates uh, the potential to fatigue cracking the crossover frequency it measures the hardness and it decreases with aging and R value which characterizes stiffness it also increases with aging. 
So, here is data on all the samples uh, for all these five parameters rutting global row crossover frequency R value and the delta T C. <coughs> and you can see clearly here uh, that uh, there is rutting parameter and global row parameter uh, as you keep on adding more ABR or if you keep on uh, aging these samples, these value keep on increasing uh, like you can see here uh, in these cases the values are increasing this way, uh, while the crossover frequency it decreases uh, with the aging and can be seen here also. Similarly, the R value it increases with ABR content or with aging and then delta T C value uh, it also uh, decreases with uh, aging. Then once we have the compositional parameters and we also have the performance parameter, then the next question was if we can find some correlation between these compositional parameters and performance parameters. So people they have uh, earlier uh, they correlated some of these parameters, the composition parameter to the performance parameter. So one of the index that can be calculated is uh, the colloidal index also from the SARA composition saturates and asphaltins uh, and divided by the aromatics and resins. And other researchers who found they found a relationship between the large molecular size material and then thermal cracking properties of the pavement. Similarly, another model uh, showed uh, the GPC parameter to the temperature susceptibility para parameters and then they also used uh, the regression analysis of the GPC data to predict the viscosity failure temperature based on LMS and SMS and then another researcher he developed a model to predict the rejuvenator content of the recycling agent with LMS material. So then we started looking at uh, we had compositional parameters on one side and we have rheological parameters on one side. So we started looking at what parameters uh, correlate uh, with the uh, rheological parameters. So for example, uh, in the global row we found that it shows good correlation with SMS which is coming from GPC and carbonyl and sulfonyl index which is coming from the uh, FTIR. But some parameters uh, we did not see uh, like it is kind of uh, not very good relationship here between the lower row and resins and here we did not see any relationship between lower row and uh, large molecular weight size. So this table um, shows all the R square values between the chemical parameters on this side and then rheological parameters on this side. So the ones which shows uh, some fair or good correlations are the ones in greens. So here you can see that the small molecular weight size shows a good correlation with lower row here, also shows with uh, this one and then with also shows good correlation with the rating parameter. So based on this, then we uh, came up with this some preliminary thresholds and these are based on the sample set that we studied in this and here you can see that um, once the values if the value is uh, less than uh, 200 kilopascals or and the rutting is less than 300 kilopascals then we are good and similarly if the delta T C value if it is higher than minus 5 then it is good and if W C is higher than 20 hertz then the binders are in good condition right now. Similarly, these are the chemical uh, parameters, uh, thresholds for the chemical parameters. If the chemical parameters are in this range, then it means the binder is okay right now. And these are resins, asphaltins and residues. So Puneet used uh, these rheological parameters and then these chemical parameters to come up with threshold values. and here is the global row on this side and then carbonyl index on one on another side. So he used uh, the virgin samples then RTFO, PAV and double PAV samples to come up with these threshold values. So once he came up with these threshold values then 
uh, then you can put all the samples in this and then you can find out any samples which are outside these threshold values are the problematic sample and then they can uh, be they cannot they may not have uh, a longer life and they can also show some poor performance properties so in conclusion uh, we showed that uh, in sara analysis that aging and blending with rap and ras it decreases aromatics and it increases the resins and asphaltins and ras and rap have the highest resin and residue content in molecular weight we saw that uh, we showed that the aging increases the large molecular weight size and the larger decrease in small molecular size with aging similarly in carbonyl index um, we came up with some numbers that the virgin samples have less than 0.04 values while the reclaimed samples have higher than 0.10 samples and elemental analysis also showed uh, the increase in oxygen content on aging and we showed that uh, with some preliminary qualitative information that afm can be used to study the microstructures uh, and to see if we are getting a good blending and mixing and uh, also to study the saturates and asphaltins in the binder in uh, the rheological parameters uh, we saw the consistent trend with all the dsr and vbr test with aging and uh, then the difference in chemical composition and rheological uh, characteristic of the binders if uh, you are just going to rtfo you don't see that big of a difference but when you go from rtfo to pav then that gap, gap increases a lot and even when you go from PAV to double PAV, then uh, that you start seeing a lot of difference in those parameters. The double PAV binders uh, have a chemical composition and rheological characteristics similar to those with a higher content of reclaimed binders. And when the ABR level, uh, level is uh, low, then the extract, extract, uh, extracted binder, it shows a similar aging progression with its base binder and if the abr uh, level is higher then you have risk of increased brittleness uh, right after production which is equivalent to extra long term aged sample and in correlation we found that uh, the carbonyl index and sulfonyl index they have the best correlation to the rheological parameters um, and then we also saw uh, the good correlation between glover row and rutting parameter with carbonyl index sulfonyl index and uh, Small molecular, uh, small molecular weight size. The asphalt concrete, which has like higher IB, ABR content, uh, they are already at critically aged conditions uh, right after production. Um, so the aging progresses very fastly in those kind of samples. And these are some of the things that we are planning to do in future. Uh, we are planning to strengthen these correlations with the big sample set. Uh, to generate eventually our target is to generate a prediction model based on these uh, chemical functionalities and the way we want to do is uh, separate the SARA fraction so that we can provide the absolute numbers uh, of the SARA and then develop these methods so that we have a reliable and repeatable SARA uh, data using TLCFID then investigate the automated data calculation techniques for FTIR to uh, remove the human error and then thorough investigation on molecular size uh, using some standards uh, so that we have a better uh, differentiation between large molecular weight size, medium molecular weight size and the small molecular weight size. And investigate the effect of aging in composition of asphalt binders using AFM uh, which seems to be a really nice technique but we do need to spend a lot of time to uh, really show uh, that these are the different phases that we are seeing and then use some blending method to characterize those phases that we are seeing in the AFM. And then it can also be used to study the mixing and blending of virgin and recovered wrap and wrap binders. And finally, we uh, will also look at option of using DSC and TGA to predict the oxidation stability of the binders or the remaining useful life of the binders once the binder is already in use and then start working on developing some new materials 
uh, based on vegetable oils or bio oils or some other materials that can be used as rejuvenators or blending components in asphalt binders. And finally, uh, I would like to thank the TRP channel for this project, uh, Ron Price who was the TRP chair uh, for this project and the TRP panel, uh, Matt Mueller who started as TRP chair, then Vicky, Dennis, James, uh, Violet, Tom and Brian. And uh, to the ICT, all uh, the students who worked on this and a lot of undergrad students also worked on this project and the ICT engineers who helped uh, run some of the work in this one. Thank you. I don't think those are from same source. Yeah, some of the some of the binders are from the same source. Like N ninety series that uh, Dr. Sharma presented, they all come from the same same binder, same binder source. But he tested many other binders from arbitrary sources. Many of those results were not presented in the presentation. Yeah. Yeah, we also had uh, a separate series of samples that we got from my dot. Uh, so the sources in that was different, but we found the similar kind of trend in those samples also. Yeah. Uh, actually, I have two questions. Um, first question is about the AFM. In AFM, we know now we can use this machine or technique to capture micro mechanistic properties like stiffness, creep, deformation. I, I, I did not see, I think you used that. Are you planning to use this? Yeah, we were planning to, but we ran out of time, so we didn't do it. We wanted to look at that also, uh, to come up with a profile of forces that are present on the microstructure uh, that can then be correlated to the stiffness of the binder. Second question is about your uh, data point. Uh, in general, I looked at, uh, in terms of LMS and MS, <coughs> very close, most of the data point. So did you take replicate? Yeah, all, all the data that we presented here, these are all averages of at least three or more uh, data. I think it's more valuable than if you use the SD for yeah. with MRS then. Otherwise, when we show a trend is going down or going up, if we don't see ABRS and SSD together, it's tough uh, uh, to decide what is, because these are very small numbers. Yeah, yeah. We saw after 0 0.03, 0 0.05, 0 0.06. Yeah, so I agree. We need to put those uh, error bars on the figures also so that we can see if you are seeing an increase or decrease, you are actually seeing an increase or decrease or if it's due to the error, if it's within the error bars. If Hassan, I have another question. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I think I saw one counterintuitive data, probably I did not understand. Uh, GR is increasing uh, with increasing LMS size. Will it not be otherwise? With GR? Yeah. Yeah, it should be. Maybe I am wrong. Uh, no, if, it's, if that's the case, that's true. Large, large molecular size increases yeah. GR increases. Yeah, but LMS, I think, increasing so with true. GR. That's true. Like, we don't have a good trend, but if it's if it's the case, I think that should be okay because large molecular size increases. Look, if you have, I think, scatter chart, XY chart. Mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, not here, not here in the. Yeah. No, I just wanted to show you here that we didn't get a really good correlation between the LMS and the GR parameter. So we can take that as a good trend. Yeah. Uh, okay. But if we yeah. had seen that, that would have been true. If we had seen both. But of that's that thing. that's how it should be. Yeah. You should see you should see if you are seeing an increase, then you should also see an increase in LMS.
that I am wrong. I think uh, I expect MMS will increase with GR. With GR. LMS will increase. I think we can talk later on that. I, I do have a question actually. So you have you have run so many chemistry tests and also do a lot of correlation with the virological properties. So are you trying to find uh, the best chemical analysis techniques? Like yeah. For example, if a binder, then you're gonna run the chem I don't need to run the biological test, right? So yeah, that's that's the ultimate purpose. We want to find out what uh, which technique provides us the best uh, repeatable data and with which we can find a good correlation to the rheological data. Then we will just focus on that technique and then use that technique. Eventually, the idea is to come up with a uh, prediction model that you can take the, you can run the sample and you can just do the chemical analysis of that sample and maybe you can predict like what your performance properties will look like uh, before going uh, and exploring that too much in detail. Right. So another one is about FTR, I saw you have using that uh, reference the area, right? So, which I think is that uh, the 4016 uh, and plus uh, some of the others. And then, have you considered the overall, you know, the whole area as the, you know, the, the calculation? The whole spectrum? Um, if you use the whole spectra, uh, since these two, um, 1450 and 1375, these peaks, they don't change. And these peaks are due to the hydrocarbons. One is due to the methylene, and another one is due to the methyl. And these things will not change uh, in it, because I told you that saturates are uh, not easily oxidizable. So those things won't change, even on oxidation or on over a period of time. So that's why those are the ones that are used as reference when you are getting those. Yeah, that's that's relative. Yeah, but there is a way that you can do. You can get the absolute values also. So you have to you have to run some standards uh, with known amount of carbonyl, and then uh, you can find out like what is the response factor of the carbonyl, and then you can calculate the absolute numbers also. But that involves uh, a lot of work. You have to make the solutions, and you have to run everything in the solution phase. Uh, these ones can be just done directly, uh, just the solid samples as such. One more question? Last one, Songa. No, no. It's no? okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> Your hand, you have to ask. You cannot uh, escape. I just wonder. Um, his question, is, his question is like, for example, when you add a rejuvenator, so it typically consists of majority of saturates because as we see that saturates make the binder softer compared to asphaltene. So generally rejuvenator is typically more of saturates, less of other or just saturates. How will you define a rejuvenator? It depends. If you want, um, if you want to design an ideal rejuvenator to soften a binder, what proportion of uh, um, SARA composition should be there to be efficient? Um, I think uh, ideally it, it can be uh, somewhere around 10 percent or something like that, the saturate, uh, but you can go from like 5 to 20 percent. So if you are within that range and if you can keep the whole thing homogeneous and stable, then I think it should be fine. But you don't want to add too much that it will start causing other problems at low temperatures. Thank you so much. Let's thank Dr. Sharma one more time.